Dr. J. Ram, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, so I just want to ask you a couple of questions. My first question for you is, why have some said that uh, urologists are the pioneers of immunotherapy? <clears throat> well, it's, a, it's kind of funny because uh, urologists uh, really were, were some of the first doctors to use uh, or manipulate the immune system for for cancer treatment. And, and that started with BCG, intravesical BCG therapy um, that, that we use and we still use uh, um, for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and, and really we, we have realized that stimulating the immune system, whether it be on a local level for like for BCG or on a systemic level um, can really help patients uh, get a clinical benefit because uh, uh, you're, you're, you're stimulating the immune system to uh, seek and destroy um, these tumors, but also you're, you're training the immune system to have more of an immunomodulatory or monitoring kind of effect over the years so that when they see the tumors down the road, they can, they can respond. So BCG was first utilized 60-some uh, uh, years ago um, and, uh, <clears throat> and continues to be uh, a staple of treatment for bladder cancer. Is there competition, would you say, regionally for sort of this dominance in um, advanced cancer treatment currently? You know, I, I think as urologists uh, first, um, you know, we, we are all in, in large group practice, um, we're all uh, 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 to a certain degree, we're, 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 we're generalists in, in the field of urology, but more and more we're, we're, we have very talented people coming into our groups that uh, have a passion, have a niche, um, really are interested in, in building out cancer systems and cancer centers of excellence. And so um, uh, I would say, you know, competition is, is an interesting word, but I think it's more about forming uh, and preserving good relationships with providers around you and in independent practice. Um, you do have to rely on hospital systems and, and neighboring groups um, and, and um, health systems um, because they're oftentimes the gatekeepers for a lot of patients and are looking for to, to, to our groups um, for, for their specialty programs. So, um, there is always competition in terms of, you know, there are always going to be other doctors uh, that are doing this stuff uh, and are interested in this stuff. I would say that um, in, you know, urologic oncologists or, or urologists that have a really strong interest or training background in cancer are very well positioned uh, to do this kind of stuff uh, and, and do it well. Um, and patients, what I found is patients prefer that. Patients prefer to have as much interaction uh, with their urologist uh, going forward in these cancers um, as possible. And so um, I, I don't really look at it as an adversarial type of relationship where you're trying to outcompete somebody else. I, I think it's um, convenience, uh, patient, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, patient efficiency, workflow, trying to get patients uh, the, the most bang for their buck um, and the most uh, efficient uh, and value-based care, I think, flows through the urologist first. What immunotherapy for bladder cancer would you say yields the highest quality of life uh, right now in advanced cancer treatment? Well, um, you know, bladder cancer is a really interesting space right now. There, there's a lot of um, uh, exciting things coming. Um, you know, really what we're, what we're seeing is two, two kind of areas develop non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and then uh, uh, advanced bladder cancer, which is really metastatic or post, uh, post, uh, you know, radical cystectomy, uh, or post chemotherapy, um, you know, those two kind of buckets. And, and so if you're looking at advanced cancer, um, we know that patients who have previously had, um, platinum based chemotherapy are great candidates for immunotherapy based on, um, based on the fact that, you know, if they've progressed uh, or show signs of further disease, um, there, there are uh, approvals uh, for, for immunotherapy. In terms of quality of life, you know, uh, the, there is now good data that there is a lot of safety as, long, as well as efficacy with a lot of these immunotherapy agents. 
uh, patients with advanced bladder cancer, you know, they're, they're patients who are ill in, in general. Um, but what we're seeing more and more of is that the newer agents, uh, including immunotherapy, including targeted agents, um, these treatments are allowing patients to get good treatment in second, third, fourth line and still preserve their quality of life. Um, and, and so what we're, what we're trying to do is really convert this active acute cancer process into more of a chronic disease process where patients get treatments periodically and still have a high quality of life. So um, why would you say uh, immunotherapy hasn't been used as much for treating prostate cancer? Well, we, we're all trying and there's a lot of clinical trials that are, um, that are underway um, that are looking at this. Um, the preliminary wave of data, I think, suggests that prostate cancer is just not as unstable a disease process as some of the other cancers, uh, meaning on a molecular level, we're not seeing as much in terms of tumor mutational burden. We're not seeing um, as much in, in terms of mismatch uh, uh, repair mutations. Uh, those are indications uh, uh, for, for immunotherapy. Um, and, and, and there is some differences in the immunogenicity of these cancers as well, in terms of what, you know, what kind of reaction they elicit from the immune system. Um, and so um, there are a couple of large studies that have studied adding immunotherapy to uh, oral uh, androgen receptor-based therapies and metastatic CRPC. Those have uh, unfortunately not been very uh, conclusive in determining that uh, uh, immunotherapy um, can improve survival in that setting, but there are still a lot of other settings in prostate cancer where we are testing that, uh, most notably in metastatic hormone sensitive disease uh, and also in patients that have specific mutations such as um, uh, mismatch repair mutations, patients who have um, uh, CDK12 mutations. Those are more um, uh, enlightening uh, prospects for, uh, uh, for, for immunotherapy to work. Uh, but so far, what we're realizing is that the pool of patients that have some of these mutations in prostate cancer is significantly lower than in some of the other cancer types. And so um, there just doesn't seem to be as many candidates in prostate cancer. I see, I, I like your optimistic outlook. Um, so I read a lot about um, adverse events or AE. Um, how can a practitioner in your opinion um, effectively anticipate and or manage these adverse events when they're administering immuno immunotherapy? Well, I, you know, I. I think this is a, a, a popular topic now as a lot of big group uh, uh, programs in urology are, are thinking about adopting uh, IO-based pathways um, and, and infusing in their own facilities. Um, certainly having a structure in place, having experience with uh, delivering uh, cancer treatments in an advanced prostate cancer setting will help um, and, and, and utilizing that infrastructure um, but it, it really starts with having a, um, one or two champion physicians, I think, who are really uh, involved uh, and are trying to build an integrated program um, that will, you know, kind of take the take the baton and move with this um, because you need you need good physician oversight and leadership, um, and then you need that physician to kind of put together a team um, that can help manage the adverse events. So I, I will say that um, the adverse events um, happen, um, but they are tend to be very manageable uh, in, in, in these patients, especially in patients that have localized disease processes and are not metastatic. So, uh, you know, in, in our experience, it starts with a champion provider uh, uh, and that builds out a, a, a team um, uh, and, and you can utilize a lot of the same resources and structure you have from your existing uh, cancer networks and cancer uh, 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 protocols to do this. Um, and it's just different. Immunotherapy-based uh, side effects are different than what urologists are used to dealing with, but that doesn't mean that it's something that can't be overcome. So um, uh, I think putting together a team um, and having uh, some, uh, you know, high-level oversight uh, is really the key to, to making sure that it works and it's safe. 
What cutting edge immunotherapy is your group, uh, Urology Associates, hoping the FDA will uh, authorize in the new future? Well, you know, uh, I think in general we're all we're all uh, uh, very active here uh, at our center in in clinical trials for the three main urologic cancers, and um, we're we're seeing some exciting uh, things in, in all of them. But probably what we're closest to is getting. Uh, an approval um, for immunotherapy in the adjuvant space after uh, nephrectomy for patients with renal cell carcinoma. The, our, our our site was um, one of the uh, one of the uh, top enrollers in in, in the um, keynote five six four trial, which which studied pembrolizumab after uh, nephrectomy in patients who were high risk for recurrence, uh, and that recently read out uh, as having a, a, a very positive result of. of reducing recurrence um, by up to 30 to 35% um, in those patients. So um, that's an exciting option for patients who are healthy and motivated and have had a good result from their nephrectomy, um, but are high risk for recurrence based on their pathology. So uh, I'm excited to, to see immunotherapy expand uh, into more uh, localized settings, uh, neoadjuvant, adjuvant um, in all tumor types, because I think urologists can be more uniquely involved but what it's what it's looking like is that kidney is going to be the next uh, kind of one of the next hot areas for this. So now I want to switch gears just a little bit. So um, would you say running an advanced cancer uh, therapeutic center is a lucrative operation? Would you say it's it's one where um, there's high overhead, there's a lot of financial risk? How would you categorize it? Um, you know, I, I think that. Uh, in, in, in general, the you you have to have cultural buy-in of the group. That's kind of my my way of saying you have to have the group being on the same page uh, in terms of referrals and understanding that there are always going to be people in the group that maybe um, have a better angle, a better approach, maybe a little bit more information in, in being able to help a patient through a certain situation. So. Um, that may not be for everybody, and, and the structure of various groups sometimes makes that difficult. But for a group um, our size, uh, which is you know now kind of a medium-sized group, um, it used to be a large group, but now with a, a lot of groups kind of joining and aggregating across state lines, it's now our group is kind of a medium-sized group. Um, I think that this is very uh, very uh, easily done, and and I would say that. Yes, there are always going to be some concerns about um, finances and how do you generate revenue in a program program like this. Um, but but there's a lot of uh, reasons to do this um, that will eventually lead to revenue for the group. And and so you know my opinion is that doing all of this and building and building these programs and organizing things around certain diseases is going to enhance in general, it's going to enhance your visibility in your, in your community, and it's going to make more patients come. Um, it's going to make, uh, it's going to enhance your reputation as a group. It, it's going to uh, improve uh, the, the dynamic of how patients view you and, and how your referring doctors view you. And so you're going to get more patients, which is going to help uh, on that revenue standpoint. But also a lot of these programs and initiatives have kind of indirect sources of revenue built in, in, in terms of, um, you know, in, in, for example, you know, being an active infuser of immuno-oncologic agents um, has, has given us a nice benefit of, of getting us involved in clinical trials, which is, which is a positive uh, uh, revenue source for the group. Uh, it has allowed us to keep patients in the practice longer, to offer patients other services that are related to their cancer treatments and to the surgeries that they've had with us. Um, and so those are, you know, kind of indirect sources of revenue that I would say are very important. You may not see those on the front page of, of all of these treatments that you're offering, but that ends up coming in uh, into play. And then again, as you assemble more and more of the pieces for these programs, um, navigators, staff, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, um, administrators, all of those people start to work together to really improve 
the efficiency, the quality, um, newer things are being brought in. Uh, and so, you know, as a physician, as, as a doctor, I, I, I certainly cannot do any of this stuff by myself. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, imperative that I have a good team who's looking out at things and uh, who are able to tell me, well, this is something we should do. This is something, this is an, uh, an avenue we should explore to try and get this uh, done for our patients or, or improve our workflow or our efficiency or our um, uh, menu of clinical options. So um, as all of those things work together, we're seeing that the scale um, you know, the scale really increases in terms of the volume of patients and what we're able to do. Um, and, and it has been a, really a positive from our standpoint, but it doesn't happen right away. Uh, and that's, that's the, the somewhat difficult part is there's a little bit of investment and weight um, in order for that to happen. But I can tell you that, that if, you, if you put some time into it and have motivated people involved, it ends up being, you know, quite favorable for the group. That's great. You talk about a lot of the positive aspects. Um, can you just talk a little bit about some of the drawbacks that you or maybe that you've um, heard of other practices experiencing when they're starting out doing immunotherapy or they're managing these upgrades to their practices treatments? Well, there's always there's always going to be some uncertainty. And, and you know, right now, there is not a massive number of patients that are eligible for immunotherapy, um, you know, in, in urology practices right now. You have an indication in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and then the remainder of indications are usually in a medical oncology setting, which is after definitive treatment or when they're metastatic or just before they become metastatic. So you're looking at low volumes of patients, uh, especially if you're not very active in clinical trials, that could mean that it takes a while to ramp up. That could mean that um, you're investing in this infrastructure for a very small amount of, of clinical volume. Um, and so it could be hard to get the ball rolling uh, in that situation. Um, so so you're, you're always gonna have a, a little bit of um, uncertainty about how things are gonna go, but um, you know, I, I would say in general, people are going to cite the adverse events and they're going to cite the uncertainty of managing the adverse events. Um, but like we talked about before, um, that usually uh, play works itself out. Uh, if, if you have a good team and, and you have good volume and you're able to kind of um, put these patients through a system um, of monitoring and, uh, and, and, you know, like I said, with high-end clinical oversight, uh, that, that usually is not something that's too difficult to do. So th th there's always going to be, I, I think in, in, in what we do every day, it's nice to have a predictable workflow. We know what we're doing. You know, all of us are very, we want our days to be comfortable and we want to be able to say, well, I know it's going to take me an hour to do this procedure. I know exactly how this patient's going to respond. Uh, I, I, I want my clinic at a set at a certain number because I know that, that it'll, it'll take me this amount of time. Um, so, so this is a little bit outside the box in terms of pushing those uh, barriers. And, and I would say probably the biggest drawback is, is some of the uncertainty um, that comes with starting a new program, managing some of the newer adverse events. Um, th th those are going to be some of the drawbacks. Got it. So um, just want to talk a little bit about you personally. Um, what made you take this leadership role as a partner um, at Urology Associates? Well, I think, you know, I was fortunate that I, I, I came into a, a group and a practice that already had some of the um, some of these building blocks and some of this infrastructure. We were one of the first groups that had an advanced prostate cancer center and ran clinical trials. Um, um, you know, amongst a lot of urology groups, we had a, a lot of good uh, leadership in our group before I got here. So, um, you know, I, I was interested in, in doing some of this stuff. Um, I, I really am <clears throat> passionate about bringing kind of a high-end uh, academic-like approach to our community patients and into the community sector, um, because I think that that you know, um, in, in a lot of areas, um, that's that's kind of the first doctor people see, uh, and 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 it, it's really nice to have resources um, to be able to not just treat patients in the community, but be able to say, okay, well, here's 
four different things we can do. There's a clinical trial. There are you know other uh, options out here um, than just doing you know what what you know uh, maybe you've read about or, or, or what someone else told you about. So <clears throat> I, I, that really my interest is is improving um, cancer care. Uh, in general, uh, for for patients in the community, and, and uh, I think being part of this uh, is, is really great because I think we've been able to do it, um, and and we've had a lot of great support from the doctors in our group, but but also um, industry and, and organizations like Lugpa uh, are really uh, providing a nice scaffold for big groups to be able to do this, and I and I think it's it's really exciting and. Um, you know, we're, we're not just benefiting patients now, but some of the work we're doing is going to change the field in the future, is going to impact how patients are treated ev everywhere um, in terms of some of the clinical trials and, and some of these things. And, and then, you know, also in, in terms of the immunotherapy, it, it's, it's really exciting to be part of this. This is a, a really, really um, uh, important time. And I, I think, you know, centuries down the road, they're going to look at look back and say, well, this is when immunotherapy was implemented for cancer care um, because this was, you know, such a, such a significant breakthrough for our patients. So as a urologist, it's really cool to be doing this and bringing this directly to patients. Uh, and I can't tell you how many urologists, uh, both in private practice and in academic circles, um, have, have reached out to me and some of my other colleagues that are doing this um, and, and been very interested and excited uh, that, that, that we are getting involved in this um, because I think they all want to really take that next step and take care of patients even further. So um, what are some of the concerns or maybe questions that some of your mentees have um, about private practice or oncology or advanced cancer care? I have some <clears throat> academic affiliations and I'm fortunate enough to, to work with some of the nearby universities and, and, and work with some of the residents. Um, and then, you know, I really enjoy um, being part of certain organizations that, that work closer with, with uh, trainees. Um, you know, I think it's, it's very common for residents and fellows um, coming out of training um, to, to wonder, well, what is life going to look like in, in private practice? Uh, and, and simply it's because they don't really have much exposure to it. Maybe they have a three or four month rotation where they, um, uh, where they, they're at a, a community health system. Um, but the majority of their training is spent in academics and, and they really identify with that. That's their, that's been what, you know, you know, six to nine years of their training and their most recent life has embodied. So, so they understand the schedule. They understand the the dynamics, um, they really appreciate the team-based atmosphere and having a lot of people around and the conferences and the intellectual stimulation. So I think the most common thing is, is well, is any of that around in private practice? Um, and so uh, I, I think you do have to, uh, I, I, I've, I've, I've told, you know, residents um, for years that I've worked with that uh, it's really everything is what you make of it. And, and in, in big groups or larger groups, you have that opportunity as much as you want. Um, you know, we have um, we have CME events. We have conferences every couple months where we talk about cases. Um, uh, we have, you know, uh, if you go into our break room on any given day, you'll have 10 urologists talking about um, different cases and what they're doing and getting opinions. Um, so, so you do have that kind of collegiality there. And then, you know, in terms of clinically, I, I'm, I feel, you know, really strongly that you can do just as much clinically in private practice as you, as you want. Um, if you want to build a program where you're doing very complex uh, renal surgery and, and, uh, and, and retroperitoneal surgery, you can have that. Um, there, there are always certain logistical things that, that will make it maybe a little bit more difficult um, uh, in, in private practice to, to do that. But, but we have, we have had people, um, in certainly in, in large groups across the country who have very, very busy, uh, uh oncologic practices. So, um, it's really what you make of it. I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm fortunate to have a little bit of a hybrid practice where I do a lot of, uh, uh, things with research and clinical trials. Um, I have a, a, a very high volume cancer practice, but I also enjoy general urology. I think all of us have to, um, uh, if you do what we do. I mean, I enjoy doing stones and men's health and, uh, you know, I, 
I, I'm not the expert in our group in those at those topics, but I could certainly help uh, patients along the way until they potentially need uh, someone else. And, and so I enjoy the variety and the diversity of that kind of stuff. And I think that's a big reason um, to, to, to go into private practice if you do enjoy that kind of stuff. That's awesome. So lastly, um, I read that you were considered, quote unquote, the busiest leader in robotic surgery, not just a leader, but one of the busiest. So with everything that we've talked about, um, how are you able to do all this? How are you able to be a leader at your um, at your practice, also be a urologist, also work with research and clinical trials, and maintain some sort of work-life balance? Well, uh, you know, again, I'm fortunate in that uh, I uh, I came into a group that has a great culture, a great um, just a great group of people uh, that that are all working together. You know, every single person in my group I consider a friend. Um, we don't have these kind of you know across town pod systems where um, certain doctors don't know each other and 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 they're kind of walled off from each other. Um, so so I think it starts with having a great group, but um, you, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I came into the group with the specific expertise in robotic surgery. There were others who were doing some of it and they're still great and they still do a lot. Uh, I've been fortunate to, you know, be involved, um, you know, in, you know, prostate cancer is obviously, a, 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 the main thing that most urologic oncologists will see, but, um, from the very beginning, I kind of branched out to do bladder and kidney. Uh, and I really tried to push those programs forward and I got really busy um, with, with bladder and kidney surgery. So, um, you know, I've been fortunate. I, I think, you know, volume uh, is not necessarily, you know, you want to be able to take care of your patients well. And I think if you're good at what you do, um, you're going to get busy. Um, but, but there's, you know, in private practice, you know, I tell some of the, our younger doctors in our group, you have to put yourself out there. You have to be passionate about it. You have to meet all the referring doctors and tell them what your what 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 your experience is and 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 how you think you can do things a little bit differently. Um, and 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 I think it feeds forward into research. I think that the reason I think our research programs are effective and we've been able to accrue really well is that we're clinically very busy. Um, you know, we don't we don't have just one doctor managing the research program who doesn't see patients. Um, the doctors that manage the research program are arguably some of the busiest doctors in the group. So, so that all translates because if I have a really busy uh, and, and new and niche bladder cancer practice, I'll be able to, to send patients for these bladder cancer trials easily because I have, um, you know, a big volume of patients and I, and I, and I, you know, stay very uh, active in, in the academic side of, of what's going on and, and, and go to the meetings and whatnot. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's just being in a good group and and uh, and being passionate about it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it, I, I think that that the, the message uh, for residents and fellows and trainees is um, it, it can certainly, you can certainly have whatever type of practice you want. I, I, you know, you obviously you have to do some due diligence about what's going on in, in the group that you're interested in joining and, and who's doing what, but you certainly can have a, a, a really busy practice in whatever discipline you want if, if, if you're passionate and you set it up and, and you take the time to kind of um, put everything in place. So, um, yeah, it's, it's fun being busy. Uh, it, it is a little bit tiring. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Um, but again, the nice thing about being an independent practice is, is you kind of make your own schedule. Um, and, and that's to me invaluable. Um, I don't have anybody telling me, uh, exactly what I need to do, how much I need to work, what, you know, uh, what time uh, I need to go home. Um, you know, the, the most successful part of my life is my family and, and, and being able to spend time with my family and my three kids. And so, um, you know, that, that to me is, is, is really important is, is being able to, to, to make my own, you know, kind of schedule and do things a little bit on my own terms. Um, uh, otherwise my wife would kill me. So. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. J. Brown. Have a great day.